Hi, my name is Dr. Geraldine Henwood and I'm a retired literacy specialist who retired from Lower Marion High School. Uh, I have the pleasure today of introducing a former colleague, Dr. Sybil Gilmore, uh, who uh, has gone on from retirement to spend some time in Costa Rica, in fact I think it's been 10 years, uh, developing ecologically uh, a valuable curriculum with a Quaker-based school there. And most recently uh, has been the author of a few books. And it's the books and her authorship that I'd like to discuss with her today. Welcome, Dr. Gilmore. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Henwood. Oh, well, the first thing I know I'm interested in learning from you is uh, why do you write? So, um, I guess for me in particular, as an out-and-out -out introvert, <laughs> and as somebody who really needs clarification of my thoughts and thoughts that are always going around in my head, writing is the best outlet in the world. Also, I have a feeling, I like to convince people. I like to tell people this is what they need to do and this is what they need to know. And somehow in writing, that seems to be bring that about more than anything else. So for example, you probably don't know, when I was in Lower Marion I, 25 years ago, I had the notion that I could write editorials. So I did, and I wrote editorials. I submitted them to the Philadelphia Inquirer. That would not work now, but the Philadelphia Inquirer thought they were great and decided they would you know, print them. And that sort of said, well, and people responded and sort of said, okay, continue with this. So then there were short stories, and then there were plays. And you know when you're working full-time, there's not that much time for the literary, for the actual literary effort. When I came back from Costa Rica, I felt that there was time for me to actually engage and fulfill my passion about writing historical fiction and if you want to ask me why is my passion for historical fiction, I can tell you that as well. But writing really does help with clarification of ideas. If you have to convince somebody of something, write it out first. See if the arguments work. I always tell that to my grandkids. They don't always listen, but it's sort of my, my thrust, my point of view. Very interesting. I, I do so admire the fact that after retirement, you didn't stop. You kept following interests, following passions, and uh, it's really a lesson for many of us uh, as we age especially. There's so much to do. Well, I could tell you that comes from being in education that comes from being in teaching education for 30 years, for 40 years. If you don't continue to learn and want to pursue learning and help other people learn, you're not valuable upon this earth, is <laughs> the way I feel about it. Okay, um, and I would like to encourage people and say it is the greatest profession as far as I'm concerned. And it's led me into all these other things to continue learning and to help other people to learn. Right. Well, uh, I think a separate question, although connected to what you were just saying uh, about its being your, your passion, uh, it, what influenced you to become a writer? Particularly what I said, the, the need to clarify thinking, the need to convince other people, and the need to say, I need time myself. What do I want to do? in my myself time, <laughs> my own time, and it is writing. Mm. The other thing is playing the piano, but mostly writing. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned historical fiction, and right. one of your most recent books uh, is one that, that I've read right. uh, called Chasing Stolen Art, right. and it's geared toward an adolescent population. So having been a, a literacy high school specialist, uh, at the time that adolescent literature really came into its own and exploded. Why did you choose to focus on that population? You know, it's, it's interesting. You know, the first two books that I wrote, one which is published, the other which is lying in the second drawer on my desk, it's not published yet, but the first two books that absolutely dealt with history, historical fiction, the first book 
was the Jew and the Pope, and it was influenced by a reading I had done in Constantine's sword about the history of the Catholic Church and the Jews, and Pope Paul III was absolutely, you know, supportive of the Jews in the community, and then somehow things change, and by Pope Paul VI, and this takes place in 1542, by 1555, the Jews are placed in the ghetto because of a change. Um, so that book was definitely for an adult audience, but it involved my interest in history and art because Michelangelo plays a part in that story. That's what you can do with historical fiction, as long as you keep it relatively true. The second book was about the uh, Mississippi flood. Again, it came about after reading a book called Rising Tide by John Barry, and that flood of 1927 really changed the dynamics of this country in terms of race. Uh, African American blacks started moving north after that flood. So I decided the third book, I really wanted to focus on what I know, the, the area that I know best. I love adolescents. I love high school kids. You know, I started out teaching in elementary school, then I started a program for gifted and talented, and I wound up at the high school. And I wound up, you know, as an administrator in the high school, and I absolutely learned that those kids were my focus. And I decided I really wanted, with that, I would do a teacher's guide, my specialty. So I said it was time to put those skills to work and focus on young adolescents, beside the fact that I think young adolescents need to learn more. They need to learn more, not necessarily about World War II, but the years following World War II and what were the implications of the history. And I really did it through the story that I tell about this brother and the sister that started out in Odessa. And yes, and, and having myself read the book, uh, I just want to let the viewers know that not only your book, but many of the books that are focused on the adolescent population uh, are very interesting and fast reads for adults. Thank you, dear because it's well plotted to be a fast read. Right. So, so I try to keep language that's reasonable. Um, I'm not Shakespeare, but I can plot. And so I appreciate you saying that. So it's a read that takes the reader through one adventure, if you want to call it, through their journey to find their parents' art. And I think that uh, combining history uh, is a wonderful way to uh, bring that history alive for young people. And the fact that there are uh, a brother and a sister involved, uh, very close in age to the adolescent right. reader, right. Uh, really would be very attractive and of interest to that group. Right. So I'm going to tell you something about writing. You go to a lot of these writing retreats and you go to writing seminars. And the standard answer, even if you've taught writing, is write what you know. So what is an 83-year-old woman writing about adolescence? <laughs> Maybe that I've forgotten. Or about post-World War II. See, I believe in many ways, because I'm interested in research and I'm interested in learning, you write what you don't know. And you research it and you find out and you think, you talk to your grandkids and you find out what grandkids are thinking and how they're thinking nowadays. I, I've forgotten maybe what it's like to be an adolescent. So, and I, and I love the research part of it, you know, as well. So, for all my writing teachers, yes, I heard you say, write what you know, but I also am taking a little different slant. I, necess I pursue writing in terms of what I don't know. Well, when you mention research and the research process, now that we have the internet as well as books <laughs> and newspapers and so forth, and uh, what specifically did you consult and how did you approach the research? How long did the research process take you? I have to tell you that there are some writers that write with two computers. One computer that is not internet connected and <laughs> because the internet can become a great distraction as you're trying to write. Oh, you feel, but you want to research this. How long would it really take to get from Budapest to Vienna, right? So how long? You go on the internet, you figure that out, you put that question in there, and then you start looking at pictures of, 
Oh, Budapest, isn't that a lovely city? Do you think I want to go to <laughs> Budapest? Oh, Vienna, what, you know, oh, what is that beautiful museum in Vienna? So it, it's wonderful, but you really have to be extraordinarily disciplined. So first I read books. I mean, I read, for this particular book, I read a book called Odessa. I'm giving other authors credit. It, uh, I don't have the book here. I read a book called Monuments Men. Uh, I collected tons of articles. I was always interested in this subject of the, sto the stolen art by the Nazis and the stories that happened and how people retrieve their art and what the legal battles are to go through the, the art. So I had tons of what I would call newspaper articles on my own. Obviously, I started this before I even thought about writing a book. And um, and I used those articles. But when I needed specific bits of information in order to carry the plot through, like where is Nuremberg? The kids are in Nuremberg to watch the trials, right? Well, where is Nuremberg actually? How did they get there? What road? Where would they have stayed? You know, those small details. Internet, you know. Uh, research, mostly newspaper articles and mostly books in the library. Well, I have a, a couple of follow-up questions based on what you've been saying. One is, how do you keep track of all this information? And do you have your plot in mind that drives your research? Mm -hmm. And how do you combine the research with the writing of the book? Okay, let me take the second question first. The plot in mind before I start. Generally not. I am an imaginative, lying in bed awaking in the shower writer. I say, oh, the kids were here and they had run into this problem and they did this and their parents were taken away and they wind up staying with a Christian family. What's now? Where are they going to go to school? Who's going to be taking care of this? Okay, so basically, I do not organize the plot. I sort of let the story draw me. Other writers work entirely differently. I can tell you they plot, you know, beginning 10. You might want to talk to James Patterson, one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, uh, you know, uh, it's, um, I know plot is important, but it is not thought out. I just. I mull it over after I've written the first chapter, then the second chapter, then the third chapter, and then I go back and revise. Now, in terms of the, re you know, do I do all the research first? I read a lot first. I have the articles first, but I do research as I go along because I find I really need to clarify, I really need to get this point right. I really need to know. <clears throat> For example, there there's a scene, if you look at Budapest today, you'll see a sculpture of the shoes, shoes on the banks of a river. And, and so what happened when the Nazis lined them up to kill them, to kill them, they left their shoes on the bank of the river and the city of Budapest made a monument so that research, I knew they were going to be in Budapest, but I didn't know about that. So I, in, I in incorporated. Included, yeah, yeah, I incorporated that. Yeah. Did you ever experience uh, writer's block? No. no. That's a terrible thing to say. No. <laughs> no. Lucky you. <laughs> uh, no, because if you give yourself time and you have an interesting story to tell and you mull it over, there's got to be something that's got, it's like your day, Jerry. You know, you know something's going to be happening. You, you can't anticipate everything, uh, but you plan for it, and something interesting, exciting happens. Oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a possibility in the book. But thank you for asking that question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you consult uh, with anybody as you were writing? You mentioned newspaper articles, books, what, what about people themselves? You know, I would say, I'm thinking, other than librarians who may have needed a particular piece of research, but in terms of the topic itself, you know, I went to 
museum, ex but I never consulted with anybody who actually had gone through something like this. So no, I, no, right. I did not. Right. And what, what about uh, different parts in the novel? Uh, you, know, you mentioned you have grand, I know you have grandsons. Uh, would, would they, would you have ever thought to get their reaction to something to make it a more authentic I did. I did. Not only them, but I did take chapters before it was published. So you asked me about consulting. I guess I did consult with kids. I took chapters to uh, various teachers who would say, let me into their classrooms, one at the high school level, one at the middle school level, one at uh, a synagogue. And I took the chapters and I asked the kids to react. We read a chapter together. Did it hold your attention? Do you feel that this was realistic? Is this something you thought you would have done? What do you think happened? So I actually took a chapter for them in the middle of the book. So what do you think happened before? What do you think happened after? In other words, it was a semi-teaching lesson, mm -hmm. not only for me to get their reaction, but to sort of stimulate their thinking and say, oh, here's a chapter. Here's a, how would maybe what would you have done, mm -hmm. written before, and what would you have written after? So, oh. and that sort of inspired me to do also do a teacher's guide. So in the teacher's guide, there are a lot of suggestions for them to do research, for them to maybe think of another plot, for them to think of how they would have worked this particular, cha one particular chapter involves a circus that they come across, two elephants that are dying. Would they have given the characters different traits than I gave the characters, but because each of my characters, the, the sister and the brother and the friend that they pick up along the way, have specific traits and interests. Would they have done it any differently to make the characters more interesting? Mm -hmm. One of them particularly loves animals and is very good with pigeons. So there are also carrier pigeons in this story. Right. So, you know, so, but you can give your characters any traits. You can, you know, one loves music, others do not. So that, so I really used it as a teacher. So they were my consultants in a way. Interesting. Uh, did you do that with your other book as well? I did not because it wasn't. They were uh, the Jew and the Pope was, was not really child oriented. Mm. But I did that when I went on a book tour. I did a book tour with the Jew and the Pope, and uh, you know, got it was double edged. So some people who had come, you know, to the book tour had read the book and had specific questions and. No, no. Mm -hmm. now, but for children, for uh, young adults, right? It's, it's, inter it's interesting for me to get their reaction. Yes, that that whole process I find very interesting. That you yeah. would have taken the time to right. take go a chapter. To that. Yeah. Say, what do you think happened before? What do you think happened afterwards? Mm -hmm. What do you think of the character? Yeah, right. Yeah. And um, so, uh, excuse me. I just have. To, and I always get expiring young authors who come up to me at the end. Don't necessarily get them in the group, but they always come up to me at the end and talk to me about what they're trying to write, and they want to share with me. Yes. Right, right. Because there is a, um, a high school student uh, whom I know who writes, and she was trying to create a story around an older man, and she got stuck because she didn't know what that older man would do. <laughs> So you've just given I'm me... I'm not encouraging her to know older men. <laughs> you've just given me a thought that I, I would say to her now, well, why don't you consult your grandfather? What would he do right. in this situation? Right. So that, that's, that's a good advice. Yeah. Now, so you research, you write, you get feedback from young people, uh, you let the story push itself right. through... You've finished the story. Now, how do you go about publishing and advertising? So I get a, I think the name of the magazine is, I want to say Writer's Digest, and they give you a list of agents who are looking for new work, and you write to these agents, and you tell them, des you know, what you try to do your best pitch, and nobody wants the book. <laughs> <laughs> so you go out, you just self-publish. And then you, uh, it's on Amazon, and then you try to appear before as many groups as possible. In fact, I did a reading in 
Costa Rica, a couple of schools in Costa Rica when I went back in January. And uh, the interesting thing is you would think, you, you know how important education is to me and being well read. So I went into this high school class, into this school that I helped to start. It's mostly kids from a rural area and uh, Spanish speaking, and but it's a bilingual school. And they knew what I was talking about because as part of their assignment, before I came, not because I was, they read Night by Ellie Wiesel. And I was absolutely flabbergasted. Look how many communities you would go into the United States where mm -hmm. they would not be that well. Absolutely. Be that, not be that well educated. In fact, this is an aside, I just read an article where a judge, uh, as a community service, as a, as a uh, I'm going to say punishment for adolescents for defacing a, a school house, historical schoolhouse that was black, the kids had painted swastikas on it. I think they were three white kids and two black kids or vice versa. And the judge, what she did was, instead of community service, she assigned them books. Now, how would you like that, Dr. Henwood? Oh, I'd love it. I'd love it. <laughs> and one of the books, she assigned them to Kill a Mockingbird, uh, The Color Purple, Night... Uh, Kite Runner, A Night by Ellie Wiesel. And it's very interesting to see what the kids' reaction is. And some teachers protested. They say, why are you assigning books as a punishment? Books should be pleasure. Well, I say the same thing about community service. We should all be doing community service as a pleasure, right? As good citizens, right? They get assigned community service, get assigned books to read. They did this in many ways. They, they painted swastikas on a schoolhouse because I think they were ignorant and didn't know. Mm -hmm. So, did I answer your question or did you, I digress? No, you did. <laughs> and and one of the one of the things you just said, they didn't know, uh, and sometimes hateful things come out of ignorance. And in your book, Chasing Stolen Art. I, I was very impressed with the fact that there, at the very beginning of the book, after the um, uh, the parents are taken, uh, are taken right. and sent to the concentration camp, they are taken in by their Christian neighbors right. and raised as Christian children. Right. And you sometimes think, and, and people tend to categorize, that it's one group against another, but these were human beings helping other human beings at a terrible time in history. Well, I really wanted to emphasize that, and I know particularly Odessa at that time in history was a, was a, 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 a city of much diversity. So it would not have been that unusual that there were, there were Christian neighbors mm -hmm. right next door. And I, I basically, uh, I wanted to emphasize the, the humanity of them and the kids and, and their gratitude and their decision ultimately uh, to leave but to stay in touch. You know, the book really starts out with the, uh, with the young girl as an older woman, right? And of course, what does she wind up teaching? She winds up teaching in a college, she winds up teaching art, art history. And um, I won't give away the ending of the story. Do they find the paintings? We, we're not going to. Mm -hmm. We're, we're not, not going to tell that. We're mm -hmm. not going to tell that. Uh, but I, I did want to emphasize humanity, you know, along the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Gilmore, thank you very much for coming in today and sharing not only your your book, but your writing process, the publishing process, uh, some of the wonderful insights and history that the book provides. We really appreciate your coming in today. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, our pleasure. Thank you.